had already melted, the fish we were trying to track were already moving through the streams. And so this is a harbinger of the changes that are happening. And in fact, when I would talk to the researchers who had worked there since the 70s, they would look around and say, everything has changed. There used to be snow across the landscape. There were no bushes. The birds didn't come until late in June. And, and so these changes are happening quite rapidly. And so that year, we actually had to have helicopters bring in our heavy equipment because there was no snow to bring in our equipment. And the whole time we were there, all we could hear was the, the dripping of 10,000-year-old ice as it melted in that hot sun. And rocks would cascade out of, of that permafrost. And so it just looked like the, the whole Arctic was was losing its integrity. It was given up to the heat. And if you look at, at that year, again, it was so green and, and, and lush. The next year was more normal. It was still in early spring, but, and the snow had melted, but at least it wasn't as green that year. 
The thing I'll point out is, is that the landscape is changing so quickly. This is a thermal karst. They basically, uh, the melting of that landscape made of ice that's growing and growing across that, that landscape. And so this was that same thermal karst uh, taken that year when it was very warm. And I'll just overlay upon that a photo taken the next year just to show you how dramatic those changes can be and how quick they can be. And so you can see the melt of that land. And in fact, you have to pan out across that, that landscape to see the full extent of the melt. And today, that, that, that melt continues uh, across that landscape. And so that's one story. Uh, but like all of us, we have our own stories about climate change. And my story begins when I was born in March 1976. At that point, we'd already released enough carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions. We were up to uh, about 54 parts per million higher than the pre-industrial age at that point. But the Earth's temperature had not yet responded. It was still a cool 15.5 degrees Celsius. Now, when I was nine and I was really discovering the natural world, really dedicating myself to understanding nature, again, the carbon dioxide increased more to 68 parts per million. And February 1985 was a critical point in the history of the Earth and the history of mankind. So at that point, the Earth started to respond to those greenhouse gas emissions and increase the heat by about 0.3 degrees Celsius. So how many in the room, if you could just raise your hand, were born after February 1985? So a large number of you. So everyone with their hands up was actually born into a new era in the history of Earth. So after February 1985, every month has been above average on the Earth. And so if we look across those months and those years, we are now in a new era, something that I refer to as the heat age. So all of you were, most of you were born into the heat age and don't even know what the Earth was like before then, when it was more normal. And so I think this is, is critical for thinking about uh, the young generation, as Ralph suggested. You guys are living through this heat age and, and are the ones that will hopefully help us solve it. So today, again, the, the carbon dioxide has, has increased. There's been no end to that. We're up to 129 plus uh, parts per million about 409 uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, concentration in the atmosphere, and the temperature has risen now up to about one degree Celsius. So it's taken us about 165 years to raise the Earth's temperature, one degree Celsius. Now think about that. That was something that climate scientists, even in the 1970s, didn't think was possible, that we could have such a dramatic effect on the Earth, on the Earth's atmosphere. And we did it. Unfortunately, we proved them wrong. We did it. Uh, and uh, these, these temperatures are continuing to rise. And it looks like that in the next 30 years, if we continue on the trajectory, if we look at the uh, commitments of nations around the world, we'll probably add another 2 degrees Celsius. And in, if we look at the IPCC reports, these reports have become more and more certain. So in 1990, when the first report was published, they suggested it would take maybe 10 years or more for unequivocal support that humans were altering the climate. But five years later, they found a discernible human influence. By 2013, it was deemed extremely likely that humans were changing the climate. In 2018, there was a special report on climate change and the impact of, of uh, raising the temperature 1.5 degrees Celsius versus higher. And if you read the report, and as Linda Mearns, one of the contributors, longtime contributors to the IPCC, suggested to some of our students that basically what the report said in terms of, of the probability of climate change and the human influence was, oh shit, it's happening. 
So the climate science is much more certain today. And really what we're interested in now is understanding the impacts and, and finding solutions. Uh, so you had a, a, a great introduction to the IPBES, talking about an unprecedented rate of global change in nature, up to a million species facing extinction. But one to highlight here is that there's still high uncertainty about those numbers, about the drivers, and about which species and which ecosystems are most at risk. So there's a lot of work to be done. And as Ralph indicated, you know, the big three have already been at work here for hundreds of years. So land use change, invasive species, over-exploitation, you could add pollution to that as well. But the, the idea here is that climate change will be accelerating and we'll eventually work together with those threats. And so we'll work in the background independently, but it also interact quite strongly with land use and invasive species and, and exploitation. So for example, 10,000 years ago, during the Ice Age, organisms were, were able to move across the landscape and, and reach their suitable climates. But nowadays, think about trying to do that when Brussels is in your way, or when New York City is in your way. So it's much harder uh, for species to respond, or, or when they're already at such low population abundances uh, that they're already almost extinct. And so uh, in the coming years, as global warming becomes worse and worse, we expect that the big three will become the big four. And as a biologist, my goal is to try to prevent those losses of biodiversity. And to do that, I think we need to predict which of those species are most at risk so we can really put our resources to, to save those species. And so we need to know, for example, is the polar bear the next species to go extinct? Is it the, the American pika in the, the mountains of Western North America? Is it the tuatara in New Zealand? Uh, or is it uh, this creature, the Bramlecanelmus, which we knew was threatened, who's a beach rat that lives off the coast of Australia. The Australian uh, wildlife officials went to, to um, get some uh, of the, the species so they could raise them in zoos because they knew they were already threatened by sea level rise. Uh, but by the time that they got a boat out to that island, the sea levels had risen enough and a storm had, had wiped off the species from that island. And so this is probably the first really direct climate change extinction that we have witnessed. So what, what I'd like to spend the rest of my time doing is to talk about the current predictions of biodiversity loss through climate change, how we can improve those predictions, and then some ways forward. So really the, the first time that we understood about the effect of climate change on biodiversity was this paper by Peters and Dylan in 1985. So, you know, again, there were some uncertainties about climate change, but by the 80s, it became clear this was happening. And some really uh, bright scientists realized that this might affect the way, for example, nature reserves work. If those species are moving out of these protected areas, then, then maybe we might uh, lose those species. We well, precipitated a book on the subject and a big conference. In the book, the conservationist Michael Soleil suggested that scientists are finally becoming invested in the greatest challenge ever faced by any sentient species. So this is big stuff that we're working on. And indeed, people around the world responded to that call and have made many predictions about different species and the threats from climate change. And so there's a point in my career where I was writing a paper, and maybe some students have been here, where you're trying to work on that introduction and frame it really broadly. And I want to talk about climate change and extinction risk. And I wanted that one sentence that said, well, this is the overall extinction risk of species globally. And you know, then here's my little part that I'm going to do. But I couldn't find that number anymore. I was, I, I was, I was really frustrated because you know, some species, some, Studies suggested that it was 15 to 37% of species were at risk. Uh, 
maybe up to a million species. Uh, others were focused on certain taxonomic groups like birds and mammals and amphibians and found 11 to 17 percent. Others had really wide ranges, so mountain species might be anywhere from zero to 40 percent. So I began this, this study, really it was an, an obsession for a period of time, where every day I'd wake up and read papers about predictions of extinction risk from climate change, and put them together into a big meta-analysis. In the end, I, I, I decided to use 131 of those studies, after reading about 1,000 of them, uh, I decided to only focus on the multi-species ones because the, the single species ones were species that were selected because of, of their threats. And I wanted to make it as unbiased as possible and look at both winners and, and losers of climate change. And so you put all those studies together, you get uh, this graph. You know, basically, some studies pr pr show that there's 0% and other studies up to 50%. But overall, about 8% of species were predicted to be uh, at risk of extinction through climate change. We don't know how many species there are on Earth. If we take a conservative estimate of 8 million, then somewhere around 600,000 species might be at risk. And, and that's a number, and, and that's used, and it, maybe it's useful, but I discovered it as I was writing this paper that really the, the the important point was how much can we run the Earth and how much will that cause extinction? So I went back to each of those studies, looked at the climate models and the assumptions about the, the amount of climate change. And I think this is the important uh, result of that study. So depending on how much the Earth warms, the extinction risk will rise. What I didn't expect was that it will accelerate. So people know of this hockey stick graph of climate change. This is the hockey stick graph of extinction risk through climate change. So as we increase the temperature of the Earth, that rises up. If we look at today, the risk is about 3% at 1 degree Celsius. If we reach the 1.5 degree Celsius target, which I'm a little skeptical that we will be able to, to, to hit, uh, it's about 4%, so there's not a huge amount of rise. But what's really scary is once we move up that curve, if we get to 2.8 degrees Celsius, which is really the, the current trajectory based on, on the emissions of, of countries and their, their commitments. And if we just go ahead with business as usual, then we're looking at 16% of species at risk of extinction. So I want to stop there and think about that. That's one in six species as you came here today, maybe you, you, you must have passed at least six species. To imagine that one of those might be threatened by extinction, I think is pretty profound. And why do we care about these species? Well, we can look at it two ways. One way is that, uh, you know, based on the IPBES work, these species have many contributions to humans, many services they provide to humans there are also these depositories of all the knowledge of nature that has experienced all the problems that we have faced as a, as a race, but also problems that we haven't even thought about. And so I liken each species to, to a book of knowledge in a great library, eight million books of knowledge. And, and we don't know what pages of those books that we'll need in the future, but we're burning those books right now and we'll never get that information back. The other way to look at it is that, you know, maybe some of those books don't have all the knowledge we want or need, but they're great works of art. And so if I said that we will go to Brussels to the art museums there and start burning the paintings, people would be upset as well. So, so I think there's two ways to look at the loss of biodiversity. So where are the threats the greatest? Well, it turns out that uh, South America has some of the highest risks. These are color-coded with warmer colors being higher risks. So South America has, has high risk, also the island nations of Australia and New Zealand. So in South America, we have many endemic species with small population sizes, small ranges, often arranged on mountains. And there's this process we call the escalator, 
of extinction where those species move up to the top of the mountain until there's no more mountain to live on and then they disappear. The same is true for an island, except now it's like one of those moving walkways in the airport and the species are moving to keep track of their climate and then eventually end up in, in the ocean. I want to point out that almost, well, the majority of studies were done in Europe and North America where the risks are lower. And so here we see many changes from climate change, but uh, also lots of expansions of species. And so many areas in the world remain understudied. Uh, in particular, Asia only had four studies that met the criteria of the study at that time. And, and so there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, I think in particular, Southeast Asia is probably a place where there are, are high extinction risks, just not as much work done there. So which species are, are most at risk? Well, we went into this thinking that uh, amphibians and reptiles would be the most at risk. So there's been a number of studies suggesting that they are very much threatened by, by many uh, of these stressors, but also particularly climate change. And if you look at the rank of those, it's true, uh, but there was really not a significant interaction here uh, between those different taxonomic groups and, and extinction risk. Uh, and so what's happening here is that the the studies that I reviewed are really so basic in their nature. They're, they're these statistical correlation models where they, they take a bunch of climate variables, they, they look at some climate maps of, and, and, and overlay the species maps on top of them and come out with a really basic prediction. And, and so they, they really don't treat species as species. They don't differentiate between a plant and an animal in terms of their ability to to respond to climate change. And so, you know, this is the best information we have right now, uh, but it's not our best understanding because, you know, biologists have worked for 100 years to understand how, how individuals and populations respond to things like temperature and, and precipitation, and that's not in our predictions right now. So it brings me to my next part, which is improving these predictions because, you know, we can't just rely on statistical correlations. We need to in include science in those predictions. And so you see as those, those studies of uh, predictions of, of extinction risk have, have increased through the ages, the, uh, most of them are excluding any sort of biological process or mechanism. About 20% have them, but most of that's only in terms of, of differences in dispersal among species. Some have a little bit of demography, so you know the degree to which births and deaths vary among uh, different environments, some with physiology in them, but few with species interactions or any sort of evolutionary differences or adaptive potential in those models. And so we're predicting these responses to climate change, for example, in 86% of studies without species-specific dispersal. So, you know, we know that organisms can disperse differently and they re require that dispersal to move as their, their, their suitable habitat moves with climate change. And so looking across a number of different reviews of dispersal, we see that taxonomically you go from birds to plants to antispersed plants, there's a huge difference. These are, are log uh, dispersal distances. And so, you know, birds disperse more than, than mammals, than, than amphibians, than plants. And then you have those, those poor ant dispersed plants. I mean, these, these seeds are moving sometimes a few centimeters from their parents. To think that they could keep up with, with climate change moving their, their, uh, their suitable habitats is, is, is going to be very, very difficult for those species. And even within a group, there's huge differences. So I work with amphibians and you know, we have uh, green frogs that can move kilometers. And then we have these little terrestrial salamanders that you find them under a log one year, they have babies, you find their babies under the same log, maybe they move to that log, uh, but not much farther. So we, we need to incorporate dispersal into those predictions. We're making these predictions about extinction risk at really coarse spatial scales. So on average, about 3,600 square kilometers. That's massive for many of these creatures. Right, so this is that 3,600 square kilometers in the region that I work, and I'm just going to narrow in on the actual movement patterns of 
the salamanders that I study. So there's dramatic disconnect between the scales at which organisms respond to climate change and those models and their, their course resolution. And so my student, Chris Nadeau, put together this information. So looking at those different groups, the, the red areas are the uh, area of the predictions that people are making. The blue is the actual dispersal neighborhoods of those species. And purple is the overlap. And you see that for these birds and large mammals, there's a lot of overlap between the modeling of the extinction risks and the species dispersal. Uh, but for things like amphibians and reptiles and plants, there's, there's a, a big difference between those. And those resolutions are decreasing through time, which is positive, uh, but still often not on the same scale as those organisms. We're also predicting response to the climate change without species interactions. I'm a community ecologist. I'm interested in, in how species interact with each other, and that's not in most models. And that's a bit ridiculous because what we know from the observations of extinctions and extirpations of populations in nature through climate change is it's often indirect. So here I'm color coding in green all the different mechanisms that lead to the extinction that are through species interactions. So loss of food, loss of symbionts, new pathogens. Climate change is not always direct or maybe, maybe not often direct. It's often working indirectly by altering those interactions among species. And finally, we're predicting these responses to, to climate change without evolution. And Karen mentioned that this is going to be a dark day. The, the light is evolution, because some species will be able to adapt to climate change and will be OK. But we need to understand which species can do that and which species cannot. And right now, very few studies incorporate that. There was only one study that did so. And it was done very coarsely. So it was a study of all the reptiles in the world. And the evolutionary part was one trait measured on one population of one species in the laboratory in which they said, well, there may not be enough adaptive potential to adapt to climate change. And extrapolated that to all the populations of all the lizard species in the world. So we're not doing a very good job of this right now. And if we look at across all sorts of taxa, there was this, this uh, journal devoted to the topic where different research groups took different taxonomic groups. We took the amphibians and, and reptiles. And we found that there's at least evidence for about 60% of those studies suggested that, that there were traits that had adapted to climate change. Now, most of those were in space, so there, were you know, there was variation among populations in the responses to temperature and precipitation. Very few through time. But it does suggest that there may be genetic variation that can respond in, in many organisms uh, to the climate threat. OK, so, th so these are a lot of numbers. I just wanted to talk a bit about uh, you know, what do those basic statistical models don't capture for some of the organisms that are threatened by climate change. This is a really great example. It's by a colleague uh, in my department. And this is the salt marsh sparrow. Right now, it numbers out of 50,000 birds all along the eastern coast of North America. This is a bird that lives in this narrow zone between the coastal forest and the ocean. It makes its living by laying its eggs right along the, the grass, uh, the, the very low-lying coastal marshes. And they have to complete their development before the next big tide comes in. Uh, and, and they've made their life there for tens of thousands of years. But one of the indirect effects of climate change is sea level rise. That's not going to be captured in, in many of these models. And what threatens these birds is that as the sea level rises, the coastal marsh goes underwater more and more. And because we, under, we, we can predict with certainty both sea level rise and the tides, uh, we can predict that by 2055, those 50,000 birds will be down to essentially zero. They will be extinct because they will no longer have those coastal marshes uh, to lay their eggs in. That's not picked up by, by current models. That requires understanding the nature of the system. Uh, the Tuatara is another important example. We have to think about physiology. So if you just looked at the, the temperature maps of this organism and where they live now, you, you wouldn't uncover the fact that 
their eggs are determined in terms of their sex by temperature. And so as a temperature, and so they will have one generation of all males before they go extinct. My own work is on marble salamanders in New England, and this is the idea of not just extinctions, but species can have lots of strong effects on the whole ecosystem. And so in this case, it's, it's the expansion of this predator, it's, a, it's a, an aquatic salamander, that now can live in a much broader range of habitats because winters are warmer and warmer. And what prevents them from expanding is, is ice cover and winter kill in these ponds. They are expanding throughout this area. And what they do is they, they eat all the grazers in the system. They are really effective predators. So you lose all those species that are eating down that algae. And so what would normally be a pond that would be clear now is completely green with algae. And so you have these huge impacts on not just other species, but the whole ecosystem. And now when I find a new pond, I can just look at it from 100 meters away. And if it's green in spring, I know that this predator has colonized. That's how dramatic the effects are. OK, so let's think about the ways forward now. So what can we do? Well, I'm going to go over uh, a couple different things. One, we need to build these better models to make predictions. So what we call mechanistic models that incorporate processes. We need to collect that information that's needed for those models. I'm going to argue that we're already in a state of triage, and we didn't make decisions about what species we will study and, and maybe ultimately protect. And then talk a bit about uh, some landscape uh, design that, that might help us, even if we don't have all the information we need right now. So James Hansen, in, in 1981, presented this model of climate change. Uh, it was very basic, one-dimensional model. In, in some ways, it's kind of surprising how, how close he got. I mean, he suggested that we were looking at from, from one to four degrees Celsius change in the climate. But it was very simplistic. And through the ages, though, the climate models, the people predicting how climates will change, have gotten better and better. So, so the number of models has increased from 2 to 45. The spatial resolution is getting smaller and smaller. And the precision of being able to, to predict the hindcast past climatic variation is getting better and better. So it's, it's been a real success, right? That, and the Nobel Prize was awarded to that group for, for the successful ability to, to project climate change and, and, and create these amazing models. And if we look at climate science, you know, they began in 1955, the first climate model then. 1970, a really critical conference on the effect of, of humans on climate, where we started to, to understand that climate change might be an issue. By 1982, the World Meteorological Organization declared that climate change was observable. Remember, 1985 was, was, was when the Earth really had transitioned. In 1989, the IPCC, the governing body of, of that science, was formed. If we look at climate biology, it wasn't until 1985 that we had our first prediction about climate change effects on species. Uh, that followed pretty quickly a, a really major international conference that brought together people to think about this idea for really the first time. A number of papers in the, in the early 2000s suggested that the biological impacts of climate change were observable. And then IPBES was formed in 2012. But you can see that biology is behind quite a bit. And we have to catch up quickly because climate change is happening now. We're already seeing extinctions happen. So we really need to, to move forward quickly. I, I estimate that we're about 20 years behind right now. And we need to make up that ground fast. So you know, one thing that, that climate modelers did was they, very early on, they, they embraced the idea that we're going to use the, the mechanisms of climate to make those predictions. And so biologists are starting to do that. And so there's, there's a number of, of models out there for physiology or demography. Uh, so great models on, on evolution in, in mosquitoes and the dispersal of butterflies and interactions uh, between caterpillars and, and their host plants. So there, there is a growing idea that we, we will need to use these biological processes to make good predictions. 
In fact, we had a, a, a group of scientists at IDIV that came together to build these next generation mechanistic models that will do a much better job of predicting biology. And we thought it was going to be hard to, to create those models, and it does take some time. But, you know, the models are great. You know, we sit in the, the biologists were in the room with the modelers, and we said, well, we want adaptation. And they said, okay, tell us how. Okay, we'll write it. We'll, we'll write the code right now. What we discovered was that we could make those models and make these really uh, better predictions that are based in biology. But the big problem was at the end when we tried to get the data to, to put in the models. Because mechanistic models require biological data, information about how species interact with the world, how they interact with each other, their evolutionary rates. And we, we, we took the four species that we thought were going to be the best, the ones that there was the most information about climate change impacts. So fence lizards and Pacific salmon and the European beach and, and the speckled wood butterfly. And so we, we looked at those six different types of, of categories, for, uh, including evolution and species interactions, with the orange being poor information and, and green being high. And you could just see by, the, by those, those colors that we do okay with the economically important species like salmon and beach, but there are still some gaps in that knowledge, particularly in evolution and species interactions and some dispersal. But you know, the other, spe the other two best species in the world, <laughs> huge gaps in that data. And these are the best four species in the world for doing this. And so basically, the vast majority of species are lacking that information. So again, we're far behind and we need to understand the basic natural history of organisms and how they respond to climate change in order to make those good predictions to know which species require uh, the work first. And so what I suggest is that we need to go back to the basics, boots, binoculars, and beakers, learn about nature, not just everything about nature, we need to do it in a conservative fashion, those particular traits that can help those organisms to respond to climate change. And that brings me to my next point is that there's 8 million species or more. And we're running out of time. And so the patients are lining up outside the hospital. And we need to figure out how we're going to triage those patients. How are we going to, to decide where we put our resources to make those good predictions and to implement plans to protect those species? But what we have been doing uh, is basically providing these, these tags where it goes from, uh, you know, green, which is good, you don't even need an ambulance. Yellow is to turtle, the turtle you're slowly dying. Uh, the rabbit is you're fast dying, that's red. Um, and then black is there's no hope. Um, so we need, to do, we need to, to apply this sort of uh, uh, battlefield triage. Already we're, we're looking at the danger of organisms to place species in that category, which is important. We need to figure out which ones are most at risk now and, and try to save those. But I'd argue another part of that is to understand the importance of those species in their ecosystems. They're just like on the battlefield, when the doctor gets hurt, they get bumped up a bit because they're going to save more patients if you can save them as well. And so there are certain species that have huge impact on the environment, and we may want to start to work on those first. So these are species that we call the biotic multipliers of climate change. And so it's species that amplify disturbances, so based on their sensitivity to disturbance, for example, say the covariation of their abundances with climate. But the important part, part is, is that these are species that have a huge impact on the ecology of the system. And so, uh, what we often find is that these are top consumers. So, consumers at the top of the food chain, so wolves were affected by a climate-mediated disease. Once they disappeared, then they stopped eating the moose, who then uh, let the trees uh, change on the island. So, so, top consumers are very sensitive for a variety of mechanisms to climate change and have a huge impact on all those other species. So we may want to study those species first because they can, can help protect the entire ecosystem. Okay, so let's think a little broader. Let's think about the, the conservation of areas around the world. E.O. Wilson, an early hero of mine, has suggested this, this, this beautiful idea of preserving half the earth. And, and it's a beautiful concept. Um, 
it, it may not be practical though, and, and, and it's certainly not efficient. And so right now we've protected about 8% of marine areas and about 15% of land. We should continue to protect more and more land. Uh, but I'd argue that uh, we may not need to protect half the earth in, in the near term if we can design the organization of reserves and corridors in a way that can protect those species. And so what I like to think of not half earth, but green striped earth. And so this is a, a map. These, these are cities along the, the eastern uh, part of North America. Uh, they're not actually mountains, but the, the light from Earth is used to, to indicate the height on this, this uh, interesting type of map. And the cool thing is, is we can put on different preserves and then link those together through corridors. So we think about designing the Earth this way and, and how those corridors align with climate gradients. We're providing a, a means for species to move themselves in response to climate change along these corridors and kind of protect themselves, right? If, if we're already in a triage state, we also have to have robust green networks that can allow species to, to try to save themselves by dispersing along these corridors. But we need those corridors around those, around those cities. And we know that those green areas are really important for people, for economics. People want to live in those areas. There's, there's lots of services from nature that are provided uh, to cities by having these green networks go around and through cities. So it's a win-win solution. What I'd like to suggest is that we can't just monitor species to extinction. So every year there are these graphs that come out about the, the loss of biodiversity, the loss of population abundances. We can't just monitor. We need to be able to, to predict which species will go next. And that's going to take us understanding biology, understanding what particular species are most at risk. And so what I'd like to introduce is this one in 1,000 challenge. And so what this is is that there are 8 million species on Earth, and soon we'll have 8 billion people. So if one in 1,000 people decide that I'm going to protect this species, we can use the great number of people on Earth. We can use those, those people to help preserve this biodiversity. So why not? And, and maybe, you know, maybe some of you will choose a species. Maybe you'll choose not one, or two, or three, and we'll get there even faster. You say, you know, I'm going to protect the species through this heat age. And that's all we have to do, right? Because eventually we'll come to our senses. Well, you know, when I'm 100 in March 1976, my hope is we'll have solved this. The climates will start to be cooling. And the goal is to keep all those species around until that time when the Earth goes back to normal. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I guess there are questions. Just dare to do it. It's OK. He's nice. <laughs> so I'll start with the ones who are behind. <laughs> 